So uh, I'm Hibri. Um, I'm going to talk about how to create the conditions for an awesome dev uh, developer experience. Um, so I, I work for a consultancy called Contino. I think there are two more Contino people here. Um, I'm the software practice lead, um, and over my career, I've liked helping teams deliver fast, and I want I want teams to enjoy doing uh, doing software delivery as well. Um, so this is, I think, my fifth or sixth Agile on the Beach. Um, good to be speaking, finally. Um, cool, uh, on to my talk. So I want to start with uh, a story. Uh, I think Sean here shared this experience with me on a project uh, we worked on. Um, it's what I call my experience with the wall of confusion. So I was working on a project um, with Sean. And I wrote a little bit of code, commit, committed, committed it to repo, pushed it up, pipelines get triggered, it's fine, right? But in this organization, um, unfortunately, it's also funded by taxpayers' money, um, devs weren't allowed to see the cloud provider's portal because if devs see things, bad things would happen, even in the dev environment. So. When I make changes, I'm pretty much flying blind. Um, if something breaks, I do even, don't even know what break, uh, what's broken. Uh, sadly, this wall of confusion is the reality in many, many large organizations. Devs are locked out of things that they're, that they're familiar with. Um, so where the confusion starts is, me as a dev, if I want to debug something, I have to raise a ticket on Jira to an ops person, write down everything they should do, um, and send it off. A project manager will look at it and approve it. So, you know, a simple f debugging loop that probably take a couple of seconds, a minute, took hours and days. Um, Stand-ups were confusing because, you know, all the project managers were doing was deciding the priority of these tickets. Um, of course, there were more devs than ops people who could uh, do, the, do the debugging, so it's like chaos uh, every day. Um, yeah, I, can't, I couldn't like experiment with changes on the portal before community community code. Um, and it's like, a, you know, the same man, man in the middle attack. This is like man in the middle of the debugging loop. Um, uh, it's, it's really frustrating, right? Um, why it's frustrating. I can't use my existing knowledge. Like, you know, I come to conferences, learn from people. Um, I spend time looking at the cloud provider's portal, uh, doc their documentation. Uh, I can't bring that knowledge to bear to solve the problem. I, um, my focus is lost because now I have to look at Jira. Oh, has this person actually done the thing I told them to do? And then they come back to me, no, you didn't tell me this little step so I couldn't figure it out. And then that's frustrating, uh, lose my focus. And I'm helpless. Like I don't have the autonomy to fix things. Um, my existing knowledge is useless. And a lot of the time, this helplessness persists um, in organizations. Even when the conditions change, people go, yeah, I don't know how to do it. I'm just going to rely on someone else to do it. So. Um, that's a good article on uh, learned um, helplessness. So over time, people learn this helplessness. Um, so it got me thinking there's got to be a better way to do it. Um, and the impact of this like really, really poor um, developer experience is really horrible. Um, this is an article by Tim Cochran on Martin Fowler's blog. Um, all those, oops. Uh, all those um, bars are time spent, you know, checking changes in dev, uh, debugging with other components, and in like the final blue buys, um, how things work in production. So in a very highly effective environment, those things are really, really fast. But in a low effective environment, that takes hours, days, and that's really, that's really frustrating. Um, and all those, all those uh, long bars are just, you know, time just spent waiting, making, going off to make coffee, um, 
and we're now talking about sustainability, low carbon costs, but that's time just running infrastructure and server spinning just doing nothing, wasting electricity. So, you know, fast DevX has an um, impact elsewhere too. So, a, a, that's a high friction environment and a low effective environment. Um, like when we work in those environments, it takes a long time to sort of do something. And this leads to a pattern where we end up working long and long hours just so that we can get a sense of achievement that, hey, we've actually done something today. Uh, we end up working late, and then that causes a vicious cycle where we end up um, burning out. So, what's DevEx? Uh, DevEx is about creating an environment where a dev can do their best work. Um, it's just not technical, it's a combination of uh, socio-technical uh, systems that ultimately sort of bring, uh, helps us bring our best selves to work, bring joy to the work we do. Um, so on one end of the spectrum, like a good DevX is just giving devs the tools they need, like, you know, default open source tooling, download whatever you want from the internet. Here's a liberal purchasing policy that you can uh, buy licenses and not have uh, um, very, very slow procurement processes. Um, and at the other end of the scale, you know, Netflix, uh, Monzo, Spotify, you have dedicated teams who are focused on making their own uh, developer communities effective. Um, DevX is also about a lot about emotions. Um, they talked about helplessness, uh, burnout. Um, it's how we feel about the process and systems we use, right? Um, we work from home, uh, but do we dread starting work? Oh, I have to log into Jira and find the status of this ticket uh, that I have to work on. Or do we start the day thinking, hey, I can quickly pick something from backlog, fix it, and delight my users um, without worrying about how many meetings do I have to organize to get this change pushed through? Um, the other thing is, you know, when you do push it in through, not having that visibility or the observability of what impact that change has. Um, hands up anyone who's still worrying about yesterday's deploy. No one? Okay, that's good. Um, so if you don't have the visibility, you know, uh, you go home thinking, you know, you come into conference or at night, it's like, is it still working in production? You want to uh, check your email and make sure nothing's blown up or the CTO's not calling you um, on your phone or page is not uh, uh, exploding. And then you go, go to work in the morning and just like, oh, check the email, okay, nothing's broken. It's all fine. Um, so in many places, like, devs end up worrying about it. Um, or they chuck it over the wall to an ops team and they end up worrying about it. So someone's always worrying about it. Um, so, you know, when you have, don't have a good DevX, good observability, it creates all these negative uh, uh, emotions. So the work we do shouldn't be the cause of um, all these negative um, emotions. And ultimately, a good DevX um, attempts to reduce um, the cognitive load. Um, so there, there's three kinds of cognitive load um, that kind of need to be aware of when we talk about DevEx. Um, we can't do much about the intrinsic cognitive load, which is about you know, typing the code, writing good, uh, good code, class name, the structure of the code. It's, like it's fundamental to the, to the task at hand. Um, we can't reduce germane co cognitive load. This is about you know learning new things and then sort of braiding that learning into what we, into the code we uh, type, integrating new information. So ultimately, kind of we need to free up brain brain space for this germane cognitive load. Extraneous cognitive load is all about how do I deploy this service again? How do I find information about X? Um, all this kind of repeated mundane tasks that um, that should be automated. Um, 
Steve uh, mentioned about you know all the kind of the BAE stuff that we do manually, which should be automated. So we want to save our working working uh, memory for both the intrinsic and um, germane uh, cognitive loads. Also, uh, develop productivity. Um, it's important for organizations as well. Like, can, can an organization be in the elite category of the Dora metrics if they don't invest in, in DevEx? Right? DevEx is ultimately about sharpening the tools that devs um, uh, work with. And all of these organizations who are in the elite category understand it's important to keep sharpening, uh, sharpening those tools and not just always kind of focus on features, features, features. Um, and this is from McKinsey. Um, it has an impact on uh, revenue uh, and profits um, as well. Uh, so, uh, being good in the, uh, in the being the elite cat category of the Dora metrics has an impact um, on the bottom line. And you know, all, all the devs say like we are expensive to hire. We are we are highly paid people. Um, yet in many organisations, like we spend a lot of time away from the core creative work that we were hired to do. Um, I'm interviewed on algorithms and uh, lots of uh, whiteboarding exercises. I'm never interviewed on how many meetings can you organize for the change approval board. It's never an interview question. So like, why is it part of my uh, core job? Um, and this is a problem of scale too, and kind of hints to why, you know, as Technology-focused organizations grow, developer productivity suffers because you're not spending time sharpening the tools. Um, and it matters from the moment um, a de new dev joins your organization. Um, the sooner you can get a new hire being productive, the better, because you, know, you paid the recruiter a, a really big commission. Um, how long do you want to keep the dev waiting um, till they become uh, productive? A um, couple of examples of like what good DevEx looks like and who, who to sort of look for like for what like the golden standard is. Um, early on, Heroku did you know a uh, uh, good set of tooling, um, do everything by the CLI, get and get you know get push things get deployed. Uh, the Heroku CLI allows you to manage your service, monitor, um, even build out new services. Um, this year at QCon, uh, folks from Monzo talked about building CLI tools to sort of uh, to deploy, test, and interact with services um, uh, without having to you know, context switch. Um, there are some good articles from Netflix about evolving standard build tooling like Gradle, um, NPM into more um, developer-oriented uh, uh, tooling. So that's um, that's good to look for. So, DevEx is contextual. Um, d all of us devs exist in an environment that, that's unique. Um, our, the customers we work with are unique. Um, our organization is unique. Um, so, a good DevEx optimizes the developer flow within that organizational context. So, necessarily, like copying and pasting what works for Netflix, Spotify, or Monzo won't work. You might end up with a really horrible uh, experience. Which brings me to the crux of my talk, like a good developer experience is emergent, right? What we're seeing coming from all these organizations who talk about good developer experience, it's what's emerged from, their, from, from certain starting conditions and how they work. It's not something that they designed um, upfront, it's evolving, it's um, emergent, and it's um, iterative. Um, so the first, um, so I'm gonna talk about the conditions we need to um, create to, for that good DevEx to emerge. First off, um, you need to create and understand um, good boundaries for risk and responsibilities. Um, so I'm gonna use this analogy, I'm not a football fan, but this is the way I sort of explained it to someone. Um, imagine you had one football field, 
and there are eight teams playing four different games on the same field. So there's like four footballs just kind of flying around and uh, it's like 88 people on the pitch. Everyone's playing, this, playing different games on the same pitch. Um, and where there's frustrating developer experience is kind of akin to that. Everyone's playing different kinds of things on the same thing. But then if you start kind of, you know, layering up those uh, uh, football fields into kind of, you know, different boundaries where every game can be played on its own field, you're kind of creating, you're compartmentalizing the risk and the responsibilities. So on, the, on one level, you can play uh, the full football game and then another one, you can play five aside and then some, there's something else, you can play a different game. So each... At each layer, the, the, the responsibilities of what each team should do is bounded. Uh, and the risk is also bounded and mitigated. And there's a, uh, the, the blast radius is also contained. So mistakes that happen in this don't propagate um, uh, upwards, or mistakes don't propagate um, sideways. And each layer, a lot enables a layer above it to succeed. So all a platform team cares about is helping product teams succeed. And all the product team cares about is making the users who build, uh, use that product succeed. Um, and the, the layers on top uh, rely on the layers below um, by using their services. They really don't care about the implementation of uh, uh, those services. And another way of looking at it, and this is um, something we implemented in an organization we work with, um, building good fences. Um, so the, the boundaries in this instance are a bunch of AWS accounts. All the platform team cares about is about the shared, um, shared space that the product teams use. Um, the platform teams own the risk for only the shared components, you know, like ingress, egress, shared build tooling. They really don't care about the products in the product accounts. Um, they enable a team to build, run, and own whatever shape that takes place. They don't care. Um, the product teams own the product governance. No, no one in the platform team is woken up if something on the uh, product side uh, fails. And the product team also owns the financial risk. Whether the product succeeds or fails, it's up to them. So we made the product owner, the pro product sponsor, the billing owner of the AWS account. So the platform team never saw the AWS bills for the products. It just went straight to that team. So they could be in, in control um, of their own costs. Um, and that's like, that's uh, autonomy within very highly constrained uh, boundaries. Um, and then product teams don't have to cross those boundaries. Each product team is constrained within their own uh, boundary. And that, you know, from a technical sense, an Azure subscription or an AWS account is that interaction, um, is that interaction boundary. Um, Another way of looking at it is creating your own organizational shared responsibility model. Um, in that same organization, we, we use this shared responsibility, sorry, responsibility model um, to help teams understand what they are responsible for. We, we, this is actually adapted from um, AWS. So um, cloud providers do this, that they make it clear, you're responsible for this bit, we are responsible for this bit, and we don't care what you do um, so this is the orange bit is where the, what the platform team is responsible for, and the blue bit is what the product team is responsible for. Um, so we use this model to onboard teams to the platform. Um, f uh, the first thing they see is like they get taken through this uh, shared responsibility model, make sure they're understood. The product team, product team's architects also are taken through this to make sure like, okay, this is what you're building on. You don't need to reinvent the wheel, but that's their responsibility. Um, so, you know, why not uh, take this and create one for your own uh, uh, 
uh, organization and make sure it's well understood. So even when you start, like you're tooling in all these categories, um, we call, call them capabilities, might be incomplete and that's okay. What you can do is sort of, you know, sort of extend this out and create, start creating a roadmap for these capabilities. So even when things are thin around here, you know that eventually you'll have to fill in these blocks. Um, and bring it back to the developer experience, where we see a poor developer experience is when devs have to cross all these layers and do little bits of everything when they're just doing feature delivery. Like, you know, I'm building a feature. Why do I need to do a firewall change over here? or make a change to this component. I want to focus um, uh, on this bit. And understand these boundaries is like essential to the, to the developer experience because you want to know, if you're building DevX tooling, you want to know where that DevX tooling to, should focus on. You can't build tooling that just attempts to do everything. You know, we end up abstracting, abstracting away too much. Um, so it's good, good to understand um, where you're going to focus that golden path um, for the developer experience. So don't try to make everyone do um, everything. Um, another ex example, uh, this is a, 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 from a project that um, I worked on with my former colleague Chris, who's uh, sitting there. Um, it's a, yeah, a boundary pipeline as a product this, as, as much as I don't like Jenkins, it had a good feature called Pipeline as Code. You could write pipelines in Groovy. Um, so what we did was we created a pipeline library that devs just implemented, and it gave them that golden path. Behind the scenes, we built in all the compliance checks. So from day one, a team um, had a golden path all the way to production, as long as they use this library. And it'll run all these checks um, automatically, and Pipeline library, library was versioned, it had its own CI, had unit tests, so behind the scenes we could release new versions and keep the governance and compliance people happy by kind of building those things behind the scenes. The dev team even didn't know what was happening behind the scenes. Um, this library catered to about 95% of the workload, so it got them pretty much um, all the way. Um, there were a few edge cases that did their own custom stuff, but 95% yeah, of uh, the workloads using this was actually pretty good. Um, working on this, like, I now work on pipeline, pipelines in YAML. It's kind of, kind of miss having a really nice language to actually write uh, pipelines in. Like, you know, when if I write something in YAML, um, if I get my indentation wrong, everything just breaks. Um, so um, next, um, create, uh, sorry, create uh, team interactions for fast flow. Um, it's unfair to do a software delivery or a DevOps talk without bringing up Conway's law. Um, and Conway's law is reflected in the Dev DevX too. Um, Conway's law says um, orgs, are, orgs, are, uh, orgs which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the community and structures of these organizations. So how we talk to each other is reflected in uh, what we build. And here's how it's uh, reflected in the developer experience. I once uh, did some work for investment bank. Um, great DevX, they had really nice CLI tooling um, to deploy their services uh, up to the dev environment. From then onwards, it actually took 196 days to get to prod. Um, so, you know, uh, be aware of Conway's law. It's easy to fall into that trap. Um, so the DevX should always span the whole value stream, not just like one bit. There's so many examples of, you know, uh, great dev tooling that only go uh, halfway, uh, stop at QA or pre-prod, just... Uh, uh, and. I mentioned the anxiety of not knowing uh, if a change worked or not. If the DevX doesn't span that whole value stream, how can you sleep, sleep well at night um, uh, knowing whether a change worked or not? Uh, 
using team topologies to understand uh, team interactions is important. It's important. So, kind of, it's important to build better tooling. Um, here you can see how a DevX team sort of interacts with both the platform team and the product team sort of to build, uh, build that uh, tooling. Um, again, one of the biggest thing to create a good DevX is adopting an internal open source model. Um, so to make the team instructions easier, so I did mention like boundaries, but those think of those boundaries as glass walls. And when you have a good internal OSS model, teams can look at what every other team is doing and can learn from each other. Um, but you still have that shared responsibility responsi model of you know, um, understanding who's actually responsible for it. You can collaborate, but ultimately, you need to be clear about who's taking on the risk, who's taking on the responsibility. Um, so everyone contributes to make things better. Anyone can send a PR to improve uh, uh, developer tooling. That pipeline library I mentioned, we started building it in um, sort of 20, mid-2017. It's still going on. Um, and I, yeah, I checked uh, before I came here. It's still getting commits. Um, it's open source, but I won't share it because I don't want any of you going and copying it because it won't make sense for any of your organization because it abstracts away all of their infrastructure you, uh, without knowing what's behind the scenes is completely useless. So um, it works. It works for them. Um, in orgs where there's poor DevX, devs do want to improve things. But I kind of see like you know code repos locked out. You know this team can't see everything. Um, devs aren't allowed to see the ops team's code. This happened to me last week. Um, a devs raised a pull request to um, add a new bit of infrastructure. The dev was capable, but the ops team didn't understand it, and their first reaction was to lock out the devs from that repository. And now they got the project managers involved. So if they want any change. Changes. They have to raise it, put it in the backlog. Um, so, yeah, be beware of those kind of uh, barriers and um, not fall back to sort of uh, putting the fences up and uh, hiding behind lock locked doors. Um, so yeah, so, so having a good internal OSS model is a good first step in removing the barriers uh, and sort of uh, allows that developer tooling to emerge because everyone's creating, um, sorry, making things better. Fast feedback loops. A good DevX um, creates a fast feedback loop between the, between the user and the developer. Um, and I think like a sim the simplest feedback loop, if you don't have any of these pipelines, is actually have a de developer sit next to a user. Do you like what I've built? Yes, no, is it working? Fix it. Keep on, keep moving on. You know, don't need pipelines uh, test like that, that's probably the simplest simplest software delivery uh, pipeline you could build by actually sitting next uh, next to a user. But you know, as you scale, you have more users, then you start need to build more checks and balances. Um, so good DevX facilit facilitates this uh, conversation. Um, it's it's that it's that conduit, and a bad DevX is like you know getting messages from a user, oh, a, BA, a user told the BA, the BA told the project manager, and then the project manager told the product owner, and then it finally comes to the dev after it's been filtered through and prioritized by uh, many people. So it's like uh, confused whispers. And shorter field feedback loops, um, having the de dev, a good uh, DevX create the short feedback loop helps us connect with the users. And you know that creates uh, empathy. We understand how people are using, using the stuff we built. And that creates more positive emotions. Um, when, I, um, when you have a broken DevX that only goes up to a dev environment, the developer doesn't know what's going on when people are using their st the stuff they built. They're just throwing it over the wall. There's no empathy for the users. Uh, they don't learn from, uh, from how users are using the products. 
And yeah, again, don't stop at the staging environment. There's lots of focus on uh, making staging work, like lots of organizations. They put more effort into maintaining staging and the test environment than actual uh, uh, production. So I love this uh, tweet by uh, Cindy. So it's like, you know, stop having all these environments. Um, a great DevX sort of takes that all away and gets, uh, gets straight to the users. So having said that, so we created the conditions. Um, how do we start measuring this? Um, there is help, again, from uh, Nicole Foscrot and her team. So um, Microsoft and GitHub are collaborating on the uh, collaborating on what's called the Developer Velocity Lab, um, and it's worth following their research. So they came up with this um, space framework: satisfaction and well-being. Um, how fulfilled are we? So I started to measure the positive and negative uh, emotions. How do you feel about our work, tools, our culture, um, and how happy we are, and how our work imp impacts that. And performance is the outcome of the system, um, quality, impact, uh, absence of bugs, reliability, um, service health, customer adoption, and so on. And activity is um, what we do, you know, uh, how many commits we make, how many PRs we raise, how long has a merge request been open, how many comments does a um, merge request get, um, are certain individuals being targeted by, you know, ignoring their pull requests. So kind of we need to surface those things. Um, and development is an inherently communication, inherently all about um, communication collaboration. So we need to measure that. You know, um, our tools like Teams. Like if I'm using Teams, I find it hard to pair with someone. Um, um, those tools impacting how we communicate and collaborate. Um, Efficiency and flow, you know, it captures the ability to make progress um, with minimal interruptions and delays. And ultimately, the space framework helps to dispel some of these developer productivity myths, like productivity is all about individual performance, like the rock star ninja mm -hmm. dev who can um, type at um, 160 words per minute. I, I type at a measly 36 words per minute. Um, and also that only one productivity metric can tell us everything about their productivity. It's not about how many commits you make or how many tickets um, you close. And it helps dispel the myth that productivity is about just about the tools um, and the systems we use. It's a lot about how those tools and systems make us feel. Um, because you know, we, are now, we now bring our whole selves, whole selves to work. And the biggest myth is that uh, productivity is all about being busy, how many hours we work. And um, the space framework, um, by looking at the different dimensions, um, helps us dispel those myths. And yeah, so productivity cannot be reduced to a single dimension. We need to look at all these different factors. Um, and that will be, dif be that will be different for each organization, the combination of how those um, factors work. Um, surprisingly, um, there are some findings from their early research uh, based on the activity on GitHub. Um, finding flow is key. Um, having, having no interruptions gave devs an 82% chance of having a good, good day, but having interruptions has a drastic impact. It's just like goes down from 82% to 7%. Um, meetings are good and bad. Um, you know, there are good meetings, but going from two to three meetings a day lowered the chances of devs having a good day down to 60%. Um, and, you know, um, having time to reflect and not be busy all the time has a positive impact. Um, so, sort of coming to the end of my talk, uh, why, why do we need to have good, good DevEx? Yes, it's all about the tooling, metrics, uh, productivity. Um, but a good DevEx 
helps us fi find flow and reduce um, reduce interruption, so we can get into that um, uh, creative zone. And you know, it's like a happy place to be in. You know, 20 minutes in the zone, take a break, c come back, uh, and keep going. And it reduces the cognitive load of the things we have to think about. So you know, we can focus our task, um, finish some something, delight our users, you know, and then sort of go home without having to worry about what we did, the impact of what we did in the morning. Um, and ultimately, this also contributes that environment of psychological safety. Like, to be better, we need, we need those boundaries, safe boundaries where we can make mistakes and really have that confidence that the systems we work in won't propagate those mistakes. So, you know, we need to make mistakes to learn. And a good dev act should create that environment where we have that psychological safety. So to end, um, uh, the takeaways. So the conditions for an awesome DevEx um, create um, good boundaries for risk and responsibility and make sure they're well understood. Uh, make sure that the team interactions are optimized for fast flow. And most of all, adopt an internal OSS model. And as you kind of build that DevEx, make sure you're creating those fast feedback loops and not creating tools that kind of slow down the process. Um, cool. Uh, got, uh, yeah, uh, 14 minutes till the lunch. Uh, any questions? Yeah, thoughts, feedbacks, yeah. Yeah, um, so going back to kind of risk and things like, it's good to identify who's holding the risk. Um, in my experience, we found that like going and talking to the person that ultimately there is someone who's responsible for when things go wrong. So talking to them and understanding what they're worried about and have a discussion with them about, you know, what are the ways you can take away some of those worries. It's like, and then you sort of have to convince them like, okay, if you delegate the risk in a certain way, you know, they are trying to worry about the whole system. So if you kind of plan out the system so that there's risk constrained in this bit, it doesn't propagate over here. Uh, you know, you've got a good PR policy, you've got unit tests, and then walk them through understanding how their fears are addressed um, helps. It's, you, you have to talk to a lot of people to find out who's like the ultimate risk holder and you have to sort of take that plate of risk away from them. Any more? Um, first off, like, try to demonstrate, build it, um, if you do get the time to build, uh, build it, and get buy-in from your peers. Um, and um, actually, when we built that pipeline library, we had a developer town hall every, every other week, and we showed it all to all the devs. And then when all the devs saw that how fast they could do things, kind of the message just spread like wildfire. And then they started talking to their product owners management. Oh yeah, we should do this cool thing because we've done the work for them. So they, they just need to hop on the train and not so start building a new train. Yeah. Um, space framework, pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, ultimately, like, it's, I mean, not a hard metric. It's more of a, do I still want to keep working on it? Um, am I still having fun or is it frustrating? It's just kind of like, 
uh, yes, in fast-moving organizations, it's helpful to have these metrics because there are lots of things generating these metrics that you can sort of hook into and measure. But for lots of like low-performing organizations, that's, you, can't, you just have to go with your gut feel. Um, I know it's not, probably not the, not, not the answer you're looking for, but you get a sense like, okay, it, f deployments used to take four weeks, and now they can do it in under a day. It's a good starting point. Um, more devs want to use the tooling, um, and they're like, okay, we can now focus on, the, on their feature delivery without worrying about all that extraneous stuff. Does that, does that help? I'm happy to talk to you about it after. Yeah. Cheers. Cool. Thank you. And you know where to catch me. I'll be around. <laughs>